have you heard of an atheist theology professor named Dr. Francesca Stravokopoulou? She's written a book recently called God and Anatomy, and it's being celebrated by all the usual suspects and generating a lot of anger in the church. Now, I haven't read that book, and I don't intend to read the book. It was hard enough for my older Southern ears to learn how to come close to properly pronouncing the name, Francesca Stravokopoulou. My early attempts sounded a whole lot like what you see below here, but I don't have to read the book. I, I have listened enough, I've read enough to understand the thesis of the book. And unlike most Christians, even though I don't like the irreverence, I don't like the condescension, I don't like the assumption of superiority, I don't like having my nose tweaked, and then the person who tweaks my nose, oh, why are you so upset? Why are you victimizing me? I don't, I don't like any of that, but I like some of the data points she found because not only have I a better explanation than she does for them, but I've been, it's what I've been saying for years. So let's explore this a little more. Her thesis is that the original God of the Bible had a body, a physical body, and it may not have been made of mortal flesh like ours. He may have had superpowers and had an idealized form, but that he was a different kind of God from this uh, detached sky being that is later found in the New Testament where God's sending his son to take the form of, of human beings and be incarnate was sort of a, a, a switcheroo. And the idea is that, you know, during the time of the exile, they didn't have a temple anymore and they'd had different needs of their God. And so they just sort of changed God to fit what they needed at the time. And that's the big picture, what she's talking about. And she gives you know several examples both within the scripture and without to support her idea that that god in the old testament was much more anthropomorphic and had a body and so this didn't bother me like it bothered so many others because in my book early genesis the revealed cosmology written years before hers i say the same thing, but from a completely different perspective. Okay. My book is very Trinitarian from the start. In fact, I've even got a video where I say the Akkadian Trinity and the sky God, Ea, pronounced the same way as the God of the Bible of the first two letters of the Tetragrammaton and, and Inki or Enlil, uh, rather, they are sort of a distorted version of the Trinity in the Bible. You can feel free to check that video out. I think that, so in other words, this idea of a distant sky god then having a son that is more uh, interactive with humanity is not something that you know, Christians invented. It was the original condition. It was the original idea of God. And the Akkadian version, I think, is a distorted version. So God called Abraham out of there. You know, they've, they've ruined things so much. They've got it so messed up. I need a fresh start. You're a believer. I'm going to get you to a land that I will show you. But Justin Martyr, early church father, had said, and I've got the quote in my book, that in effect, when the children of Israel thought they were looking at God the Father, they were really looking at God the Son. That's, the Trinity was there. And, and it's almost almost like this idea of and the distant sky God versus, and Ea and then Lil, his sons, being more hands-on. But that's, it's just the way it was always being. But the interactions are with the Son more often than they thought. They they thought they were dealing with God, they are dealing with God, God the Father and God the Son. And that's where you get into this, uh, the two powers of heaven idea. And I, I haven't done a video about that, but I, I probably ought to. It was a significant minority position in Judaism until the Christians came along and it, it offered too much support for Christianity. So the rabbis declared it a heresy, but they saw in the scripture 
God seemed to have the two versions. He seemed to have the, the there seemed to be more than one, when one in heaven and one down on earth among men. And I even have where this happened. And what I what I add to Christophanies, Christophanies are are nothing new. Christophanies are a tradition in Christianity, a widely respected theological position, which says there are many places in the Old Testament where Christ appears in human form prior to the incarnation. And so uh, one place this might be when Jacob, quote, wrestled with a man and the man later had divine properties, the, the angel of the Lord, which really the Hebrew words there are messenger God, they, or, or messenger Yahuwah, they point, receive worship, act like God, and so the idea is this is a pre-incarnate version. And of course, God walked, walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He smelled the aroma when he came off the ark. And that, you know, her idea was, well, this changed his mind about humanity. And, and my idea is a little bit different. It's when he, uh, because, and this is a part of it. And this, this part is controversial, but. Was Christ all-knowing when he walked on this earth? Apparently not. He said, he said to John, you know, the Father, nobody knows uh, when the last days are going to come. The, not even the angels in heaven, not even the Son, just the Father knows. When someone touched him and got healed, he said, who touched me? I felt healing power go out. He didn't know. And so there were some things that he didn't know. He said he grew in, in wisdom and favor with God and men. So... Maybe if it's possible for God to give up his all-knowingness there, in some cases, the Old Testament character acts like he doesn't know. He, in the past, we've said, well, these are rhetorical questions. Uh, when he asks, well, hey, where's your brother? Or did you eat of the fruit of the tree? Or, and, and perhaps some of them are rhetorical questions, but when it was came time when he realized he had to destroy the clan of Adam because they had corrupt, they had become corrupt and they were corrupting the earth, he seemed genuinely grieved. He seemed genuinely surprised that they could turn out that rotten. And so I, I guess we could be open to the possibility that God the Son can set aside his omniscience not just when he was incarnate, but earlier when, and here's the difference, he assumed a physical form. And the, the addition to the idea of Christophanes, the idea of Christophanes is he will come and take this human form, then he'll go back and be whatever the sun is. Then he would go back down, then he would go back up. And he would do that over and over again. He, If he wanted to be Melchizedek, he would do that and be that for a generation and then go back up. And what I am suggesting is he did it one time. He did it in Genesis 127, if understood correctly, is that when he did that, when uncreated God merged with created man in the heavenly places, and we think Genesis 127 is the creation of man, and it is, but it also speaks of the man. And if you look at any Bible hub or any other interlinear translator, you can see that it really starts off by saying ha-adam there, not just Adam. And I've discussed this in other places, many other places. I, I believe Genesis 127 is talking about three things. One, in the, in the eternal realm, Christ and the church. Two, in the temporal realm, men and women generally. And number three, how do you get men and women generally to be Christ in the church? You start with Adam, the man Adam, who is a figure of Christ, according to Romans 5.14, and you go from there. But, so it happened in the beginning. And then you go from uh, God in chapter 1 to the Lord God in chapter 2, who is much more anthropomorphic than the God in chapter one, where did the, the, and so the skeptics say, well, two different people wrote these accounts and they're talking about two different kinds of God. 
because where did this Lord God character that walks in the garden come from? And I'm saying it, it's part of this process in Genesis 127, and I can't give you a 400-page book in this short video, but that is what's going on. That is what the text is saying. Right there, the incarnation is, it did not happen then because it's, it was not real flesh. But it's this kind of character that sh sh Dr. Stravakopoulou is referencing it in a human form, but with superhuman powers. Okay, and he was familiar. He was he was there in the garden. He kicked them out of the garden, but he was still among them when he walked up to Cain and said, "Where is your brother?" Cain didn't like. Hey. It's you. It's God. Oh, my. He just said, am I my brother's keeper? Like he was used to God being around him all the time. And when God says, you've got to leave this area, he said, I'm being driven from your presence. So early on, the Bible teaches that God walked with the clan of Adam. It wasn't a surprise. You're walking in the field. You're tending the sheep. It wasn't a surprise. You see him come your way and speak to you. And, and that was a different idea. That is is not you know we have this idea that that god was distant until the incarnation but in the christ-centered model the son was coming to mankind reaching mankind fellowshipping with mankind trying to adjudicate among mankind at least among the clan of adam following the line of messiah all along up until the flood because what happened was familiarity bred contempt he wanted to be with us. All the skeptics that say, well, if God's real, why doesn't he just show up here and, and show, tell me he's real? Well, he did that. That's, that's the Bible, Genesis is recording him doing that. And for me, because there wasn't, as a part of a heart change, it just produced a situation where, oh, yes, yeah, sure, Lord, we'll do what you say. And then they don't. And it became the people that, he had to wipe out, and it grieved him to wipe out his people. And so when when's the first time in the Bible it says God had to come down? It's after the flood, the Tower of Babel. That's where it said he came down to see the tower. Before then, it speaks like he's always there with them. You know, it's it speaks like he spends a lot of time down on earth until you get... To the Tower of Babel. So, yes, God had an anthropomorphic form, not in flesh like we have, but these Christophanies were not 120 instances or however many. Let's say there's just a dozen. That's a lot. There's not just a dozen instances or more of God jumping in and out of human form. He started with the human form. And Adam was simply a copy of that form in heaven, made in mortal flesh. He, the original was in heaven. They do that a lot with the Hebrews. In, in the Jewish religion, you've got the, the shy types and the shadows. You have a perfect archetype in heaven, and then you have the echo of that on earth. And that's what Adam was. He was the echo of the sun in heaven. So, they should not, it should not be a surprise that what we really had happen was God took on a human form. He wanted to lead the line of Messiah to be a light to the nations. It didn't work out. It went the other way. So after that, he limited his contact with humanity and really just waited until a faithful person came along and started dealing with them instead of taking, Hey, here's the group I want to work with. Hey guys, I'm your God. And it wasn't anything brought about by their faith. You see, they just, he, he said, I'm here. I've got this power. I can make you live 900 years or, or whatever benefit that they had. And it wasn't enough because it didn't start with faith. So it's almost like he learned how to deal with man. It, it wasn't just after the flood, I realized man is evil 
and his heart leans that way all the time. But I'm still going to spare him. I'm never going to do what I did before, which is wipe out the whole line of Messiah and cut off any possibility of reconciliation between God and man. I'm not going to do that again. I'm just going to enjoy the aroma, accept them for who they are. But it, but it didn't just stop there. That wasn't the only change he made. He started going only to men of faith and not showing himself to everybody. He was pleased when the, the people of Israel did not want to go on the mountain. They just said, Moses, you go up, you go up in the elders, and we'll stay down here. We don't want to face him. Why was he pleased at that? Because he had you know, been through for what for him was a painful experience. He tried to be accessible to the clan of Adam, and it just it totally went bad on him. They totally got disrespectful and resentful and irreverent, much like these scholars are today. And he had to take them away. To, to keep them from ruining the earth, he had to take them away. Now, you say, what about a, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night? Those were... Were those Christophanies? Because they were not in human form. I would argue that it's, it's part of the theme I've been saying the whole time. He's familiarity caused problems amongst people who didn't have the faith. Their faith wasn't right. And so the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, that wasn't his true form. That was a form he made to be less accessible and less personal and more uh, imposing on the outside to sort of put up this you know, image of I am so powerful and beyond you, which he was. But that's not who he wanted to be. He wanted to be the personal God. And when he incarnated as Christ, he went back to his roots. He didn't come as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He didn't come as in these awesome signs. He came even lower, even not even a, a, as a man with superhuman powers, but as a regular man who he did have the power to heal people. He did have the power to do miracles, but he wasn't, he wasn't Superman. He wasn't bulletproof. And so this is the picture that I've been advocating the whole time. I, for years, I've been saying that Christ, we, he said, I'm going, to go, I'm going to return to the Father. And then later in the New Testament, it says he's sitting at the right hand of God, and it continues to describe him in anthropomorphic terms, though he's God the Son. I'm, I say that he returned to the state that he was in before the incarnation, which was a state where he had a body. The body was assumed way back in Genesis 127, and that is the figure that we see in the Old Testament. And these changes are not driven like God and anatomy and the rest of these cynics are, are saying. They weren't driven by the religious leaders saying, well, our circumstances have changed. We need to change how God is. They weren't driven by that. They were driven by God, the Son, becoming the, the angel of the Lord, becoming the Old Testament God, and, and, and really showing more and more his real nature to people. And it was driven by uh, human reaction to over-familiarity with him before their hearts were right. And he was taking an approach... Really, he was the big softy who came to them and stayed with them at first, and then that didn't work, and that hurt him. You know, people, the the, the uh, scoffers like to talk about how terrible God was in the flood to wipe them out, but it grieved him a lot. And I, I explore that in the book. I explore that in the book how it sort of changed the way he did business, and that was what was driving it. What was driving it was not man saying we need God to change because our circumstances are different, but God saying I need to change the way I deal with these people because I 
it's not working. It's not producing what I want it to produce. I've got to move them. Each step is going to make a point, move them in a direction that is going to, when they look back on it after the incarnation, they'll say, oh, now I get it. But he did change his way of doing business with people. You know, and that, that was not man changing God. That was God changing the way he interacted with man. So I have gone on a long time about this, but I haven't scratched the surface. It isn't, obviously I've got a 400 page book and it goes a lot deeper than that, but that's the gist of it. Yes, those narrative points that she's pointing out, the data points, many of them are pointing to a true thing. What she's doing, uh, the picture she's painting with that data, I disagree with completely. Thank you so much for listening, and may God bless you.